The police officer involved in the death of George Floyd, calling for justice for his family and the black community. This comes as new surveillance footage surfaces showing a different angle of the George Floyd video from a nearby Minneapolis business. The surveillance video from a nearby restaurant shows the first contact officers had with 46-year-old Floyd. One officer escorts him out of a car, handcuffed, and Floyd sits on the sidewalk. Moments later, Floyd is escorted away. The officers were responding to an alleged forgery. Police said Floyd initially resisted the arrest. This video does not show that. Floyd died after an officer kneeled on his neck for several minutes. Meanwhile, Floyd's family is speaking out. They say firing the officers is not enough. They want them charged with murder. At BNC's Venice Toussaint joins us now live in the studio with the very latest on this story. Venice, what do we know now about the officers who were involved in this? Well, Fred and Fred and Laverne, Derek Chauvin, the officer seen kneeling on George Floyd's neck, has been involved in several officer shootings in his nearly 20-year career with the Minneapolis Police Department. The attorney he's now hired is the same attorney who represented the Minneapolis police officer who was acquitted in the death of another black man, Philando Castile, three years ago. My stomach hurts. My neck hurts. Everything hurts. Ah, please. Uh, I can't breathe. Those were George Floyd's last words, begging for his life as a Minneapolis police officer kneeled on his neck for eight minutes, while Floyd, who was handcuffed and visibly in pain, wailed, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Please leave my neck. I can't breathe shit. On phase and with his hands in his pocket, the officer identified as Derek Chauvin appears to apply even more pressure to Floyd's neck until Floyd goes silent. We need justice for my brother. They need to be convicted of murder. All four officers on scene were fired. In an emotional interview, Floyd's family says that is not enough. What I did see was murder, and that's what I want them to be arrested and charged and convicted for. According to the Minneapolis Star Tribune, Chauvin has been involved in several officer shootings in his 19-year career with the police department. In 2008, he shot and wounded a man during a domestic violence call after he says the man reached for his gun. In 2006, Chauvin was one of five officers who responded to a stabbing. One of the other officers shot and killed a man. In 2017, to Theo, another officer fired in Floyd's death, was sued for excessive force for punching a man who was handcuffed. That case was settled out of court for $25,000. One Twitter user wrote of Theo, quote, the Asian American police officer who stood by and helped his white colleague take a knee on George Floyd's neck must be prosecuted as an accessory to murder. Some Asian Americans go about their whole lives enabling white people to hurt minorities. They make me sick, hashtag George Floyd. That tweet retweeted nearly 3,000 times. No peace. No justice. No peace. Thousands protested in Minneapolis on Tuesday, the protests intensifying overnight. At one point, police throwing tear gas and flashbangs to disperse the crowd. The protesters chanting Floyd's final words. <laughs> Floyd's death, eerily similar to the death of Eric Garner in New York City in 2014. Video shows Garner put in a lethal chokehold by an officer. His last words were also, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I never would have believed that we would see another I can't breathe case in 2020 after Eric Garner. LeBron James among the many celebrities joining the outrage, posting this picture of him wearing the I Can't Breathe shirt he wore six years ago after Garner's death. And this picture on one side showing Chauvin kneeling on Floyd's neck, the other showing former 49er Colin Kaepernick kneeling to protest police brutality. LeBron's caption reads, do you understand now or is it still blurred to you? Hashtag stay woke. Al Sharpton posted on Twitter today that he is planning to bring together the families of Eric Garner and Floyd in Minneapolis as a show of solidarity. Fred Laverne. All right, thanks so much, Venice. And the outrage over the death of George Floyd has sparked outrage that is not going away. That's right. And the whole tragic incident, as we just saw, was captured on video. Four police officers fired. Mr. Floyd's family is calling for arrests and charges against the officers. And joining us now to discuss this, this weighty topic is Dr. Uh, Jeremy Levitt, uh, professor of law at FAMU down in Orlando. Welcome back, Jeremy. 
Glad to be with you tonight. So where are we on this case today and has the DOJ been called upon to investigate this tragic incident? The, the DOJ is always going to be slow. Obviously, there's a state investigation. Uh, the FBI is looking at a, 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 a case of, of racial discrimination uh, here. But the investigation is going to take time. It's going to be slow. Uh, th those four officers who were fired have a very powerful union behind them and they have lawyers. Uh, so now it's the information gathering uh, phase. It's hard to dispute what we see with our eyes, but we know over time uh, there have been several officer related shootings and civilians who want to act like officers who have uh, essentially been let off the hook by grand juries and prosecutors. So we'll see what the evidence reveals. And you know what? Here, here's the other thing. There were nonviolent protests against uh, the killing, which we saw just a few moments ago uh, in Minneapolis and in Chicago, but particularly in Minneapolis. And those protesters were met with tear gas, they were met with rubber bullets, they were met with flashbangs. But then we see other protests uh, for the so called right wing folks out there who were protesting who knows what, uh, opening, reopening businesses and all that. What, what, what is the difference between these two? Well, listen, if we're going to be honest, we, we, we have to have a conversation about white fear of brown people, because what's underwriting all of this is fear, plain and simple. There's not a fear of white men, even on, in state capitals, carrying their ar arms openly. And while Michigan law permitted that and Minnesota law does not permit that, the fact that you can have nonviolent protesters protesting because black people are being killed by police and other persons throughout the country and then you have protesters who are carrying weapons openly, assault weapons at that, in the state capitol, who are really protesting over a sense of white privilege, that the economy needs to be open because they feel so disadvantaged, uh, while at the same time putting the public health in jeopardy. So you have one side here trying to save human life and the other one taking action that is actually gonna cause uh, uh, human beings to die with the COVID-19. Uh, and one doing it violently, meaning the threat of force, and the other doing it nonviolently. And, and, and the issue here is, is simply fear. Uh, uh, those who enforce the peace fear brown people, and they don't fear white men who are carrying guns openly. We can go back to the Bundy Ranch case and several other cases where uh, there was open defiance of state, local, and federal law by armed white men, and there was virtually no response to that whatsoever. Uh, but it seems that one black man handcuffed behind his back with a knee in his neck is a threat. Uh, and the officer sitting on him as a symbol of that is more threatening than a pro football player that may take a knee. So, Jeremy, how is this similar to the civil rights movement of the 60s, where blacks were protesting about Jim Crow laws and the right to vote were met with violence during nonviolent protests? I want to be honest with you. I think in many respects, uh, the kind of force that protesters are met with today is more violent than it was 40 and 50 and 60 years ago because the laws are different. And there are supposed to be certain protections. There has been voluminous uh, litigation. And yet uh, we still have individuals uh, who are members of the police department who feel thro so threatened that they either have to provoke or use force inappropriately. Now, this doesn't excuse protesters who protest violently. But the bottom line is, is that if these individuals developed a counter protest in states where it was permissible to carry guns openly, would black protesters be met with the same level of friendship uh, and favor that the white pro that protesters have been met with? And the answer to that is clearly no. All right. Well, thank you so much, as always, for joining us on this very difficult conversation. We appreciate it. Dr. Jeremy Levitt, professor of international law at FAMU College in Orlando.